Good morning, everyone, and welcome to RT7 Digital, benefit of a hybrid account setup on Amazon webinar. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Jack Cooper and Stephen Lloyd. Before I hand you over to Jack and Stephen, I'll just go through some housekeeping. To enable you to hear the presentation clearly, everyone has been put on mute apart from the speakers and the event is being recorded. Following the presentation, there'll be a Q&A session to enable you to put forward a question. Please hover your cur cursor towards the bottom of the screen. A toolbar will appear, which includes a Q&A option. Select this and type your question in the box provided. I'll then pose your question to Jack and Stephen at the end of this presentation. So all that's left to do is hand over to Jack and Stephen. Cool. Thank you, Sam. Um... Thanks everyone for joining us today. Confident we're gonna show some uh, interesting insights and uh, share our knowledge on the benefits of a hybrid account setup. We are big advocates, um, I would say, of a hybrid account setup and we'll be able to justify the reasons as to why um, and also the common pitfalls. Stephen, if you wanna just move on to the next slide, please. So I think this is a very current topic um, given the direction that Amazon is going in and should be front of mind for those that are either operating on um, seller center alone or vendor center alone and don't have both in conjunction. Uh, I'm conscious a lot of the beta members probably would be vendor only. So that puts you in a strong position because you have control to set up a seller center account if you are um, if you are vendor only. If you're looking at the, uh, listening to me now and you're seller center only and you haven't had an invite to vendor, could be slightly more challenging as it is an invite only platform um invite only platform and uh amazon is not really onboarding many new vendors currently especially in the us but we're seeing some of that in the uk as well next slide please cool over to oh no there we go um so just the last thing to say on this is um i think a key focus for us and our clients has been profitability on Amazon, um, given the current market, what we're seeing and the realignment in volumes, um, you know, that large spike through COVID. And we can see that um, most categories are down this year uh, compared to last year in terms of level of performance. So where do we look and where can we add value and focus and attention as an agency? And it's um, really looking at the profitability of Amazon. I think effectively using a hybrid can make Amazon um, selling a much more profitable environment if implemented and managed in the correct way. Great, thanks for that intro piece there, Jack. Okay, so if you've got vendor, what are the benefits of adding a seller central account into the mix? So there are a lot of different areas that can that you can benefit on from having the seller account running in tandem with the two. Uh, the first and the simplest of which is protection, and that is protection against any sudden changes in vendor, changes in vendor wanting particular price decreases, changes in the terms that they want to bring forward. Um, and something that I know a lot of vendors saw uh, early at the beginning of this year is a big push that vendor um, the vendor is trying to return to its roots and be only for official brand owners. So anyone that has been doing distribution work or doesn't have um, brand registry on their account is actually being phased out from vendor, being pushed back towards seller. So having the seller account set up initially before that push means that you're not doing a hard transition at that moment when something does come up. Um, and some people didn't even receive a warning on this. Vendor just closed accounts and people were left with no account and then had to set up a seller off the back. So having that second account in the form of seller means that you have a backup. You are not purely um, at the whim of vendor. If vendor has a day where it doesn't place orders, it misses out on um, a purchase order for whatever reason, such as seasonality, you have that backup account where you're able to control things more. Something that you've probably all experienced if you are on vendor is that you will, will have set your products up uh, last year, two years ago, five years ago. The market has changed, as we all know. Cost prices of everything have gone up. Everything has increased. And the only thing that hasn't increased is the price Amazon is buying the products for. This has been a big problem that our, that our clients have faced, something that we have helped them to battle. The best option to have is to have an alternative. So being able to say to vendor, we won't supply to you. The price that you want to buy at is not something that we can support. We will run this through seller. 
then we've had clients who have done this without having seller, where they've purely gone, we're just not going to supply. They run into the same problem every time, and it's not a difficult problem to predict. The listing tanks, they will go out of stock, they will drop down the sales ranks, and even if they do manage to get Amazon to take the price that they want, they are then stuck with trying to build the listing back up from scratch. If you've got the listing on seller, you don't have that impact. Yes, you will have a bit of a decline, especially if you're going fulfilled by merchant rather than fulfilled by Amazon, but you're not starting from scratch. You've managed to keep that going. So your listing hasn't completely dropped, but also very importantly, you've managed to still keep some revenue on that line. And depending on how your vendor pricing and your um, seller fees are structured, potentially even at a slightly more profitable point than my vendor is at. Um, and this kind of leads quite neatly into the next point of optimizing profitability. So no two hybrid setups are exactly the same. And the first question I always ask people whenever I start to talk to them about a hybrid setup is what are you trying to achieve? And if it's that you are trying to get to a point of transitioning away from vendor into seller, then you are doing a bias towards seller as an activity. If it's that you are looking to get to a point of um, regular weekly shipments, just going into vendor and trying to build up demand so that you've got a profitable business. That way your bias is towards vendor. Um, if it's you're launching new products, then your bias initially is going to be towards seller or the later point probably towards vendor. I would usually say that most hybrid setups, unless it's you're looking to transition away from a vendor account, say it's got bad terms or the pricing is just non-supported, or, and I'm sure there's some people in the audience that have this, you're just fed up with dealing with vendor and you want to move to a seller environment for the control piece. Normally, though, I would recommend going towards um, vendor as an activity if set up correctly. So there is obviously a piece of, if you've already got the account, there would be a correction piece and that can take time um, as vendor, it can be very slow to accept anything like price um, increases or to renegotiate things on accounts. If they'll even ever do it, you've still got to get them to come to that negotiating table. But generally, I would say that your bias should be towards a vendor account because if set up correctly, it will be the more profitable of the two accounts. So that carrying on expanding out on one of my earlier points in the profitability piece is product launching. So if you've got new lines that you're adding in um, or you've got um, a new range or a new set of products that you're looking to add, it is generally a better way to start it on seller. So vendor does have plenty of programs such as Born to Run where you can use that to put in your initial stock. The problem that you've got is that in the beginning, you are always going to have your lowest point of sale. So it's going to take you time to ramp up. And Amazon is going to look at your initial price that you've put everything in on the, on the vendor account and go, well, that's not enough margin. We're going to need more to be able to handle the storage, the distribution, and anything else there. They're not looking at that future point. They're looking at the historical sales point. And while you can probably for the first month get away with listing things on Amazon at a relatively um, healthy margin, when they see that initially low sales from new lines, you're going to find that they want more of a margin. So being able to launch on seller first, where you get to control that price point, you get to control how much stock that you put in, because as we all know, vendor is very pessimistic. When you first want them to take stock, they're not going to. They'll have to use Born to Run, assuming they'll even allow you to do that, because they're putting more caveats on Born to Run these days. So when you've got that initial ramp up and you know how well a line is going to do, because you've sold it historically somewhere else, or it's a similar line, something else you are selling, you can control that stock, putting it into FBA, build that up. And when you've got that to a point where it is selling well, migrate it from seller into vendor, where you're able to put it in for a higher price, able to maximize that profitability. And you've got that support of the seller and vendor account working in tandem, which helps with the stock control on those new lines. So with the stock control piece, you've got a couple of different areas where stock control comes into play. So seasonality, so products that are seasonal. If you've got seasonal products, this will be an all too familiar scenario. You have your Christmas period, everything sells well. Vendors then stuck with um, a load of stock that they don't have to sit on. They don't really order much for the rest of that period throughout the, um, for the early part of the year. And then as it comes to a point where you're actually selling, they've got a slow pickup time to actually bring the rest of that stock in. If you have the seller account as well, and yes, there are options to use things like Born to run, but there are obviously allowance limits to born to run, and there are further restrictions that have been added. But having um, that seller account means you can put additional stock into seller, knowing that your seasonal period is going to be picking up, so you can get those initial sales um, through that. But it also means that if you've got additional 
um, holiday periods. So I know we've just had Father's Day in the UK. So if you had a product where you knew a large amount of stock was going to go from there and vendor hasn't brought in what would be enough stock for that period and um, born to run isn't giving you that limit, seller means that you can make sure that you've got those that stock in on that period. So what you're effectively doing here is mitigating that risk of going out of stock, which as we all know is the worst thing that can happen to a listing. So it's just going to start plummeting back down those sales rates. So another big piece with seller is price control. So vendor, when Amazon buys that stock, they obviously have full control. They will list everything at the price that they determine. They, um, you obviously do get to put in an RRP, but they don't have to stick to that. And you've probably all experienced Amazon just deciding what price they then want to sell things for. And as they lower that price, they then look to lower the margin. And they do things like price matching against um, other sites, where they, even if things are on promo. So being able to have the listing on seller means you can put in the price that it should be on there. If vendor then tries to go too high, they will lose the buy box because the seller account will then pick up that buy box. And if they go too low, you can stop supplying until they stop going too low. So it gives you a bit, it doesn't give you full price control, but it gives you what I would refer to as a price anchor. It gives you a point that you can try and pull them back to, a point that you can try and send them, center them around. Um, and a point that I brought up near the beginning of this is they are now making it a lot harder to get a vendor account. And even if you are a brand owner who has one, you may not be able to keep that. So a non-brand owner who has one, you may not be able to keep that account going forward. Vendor is something that they are beginning to phase out for people. And having a seller account as a effectively backup option as another way of trading means that if that ever did come, you're not going to lose the entire revenue stream at once. And lastly, is it allows you to be more flexible in, in trying to test out new products. So let's say you've had a range of products that you've been selling, selling successfully for a couple of years and you want to add in a load of accessories to go for it. If you go with vendor, you've got to, um, you've really got to build up those lines quite sl slowly, methodically, because vendor being so um, pessimistic in terms of its ordering cycle. It means that with seller, you can put in a small amount of stock into FBA, test out a line quite quickly, initiate and work out like what will sell, what you then want to move into vendor. So it does allow you to be a bit more flexible and dynamic in that sense, especially if you go with things like the FBM option where you don't even have to put the stock um, into seller in the first place. So if you've got things that, if you could do like a low production run of manufacturing in a very short time frame, it allows you to experiment with things like that on seller in ways you couldn't when trying to do that on vendor. So all that said and done, what is the benefit of the vendor account in the first place? So vendor account, they get the best control of content. So brand reg very much does help with content control, but a vendor account will get more control over content than a seller account. With seller accounts, you'll find that you have to provide more documentation in the even where you are the brand owner on a seller account. You've probably all seen the messages of contribution comes from multiple um, people on the listings, and this is how the listing has been created. Vendor accounts get a lot more weight in terms of those updates and changes. So even if you did want to run, um, if, you, if you wanted to fully move away from vendor, you didn't want to supply anymore, pricing's unsustainable, the contracts aren't good, for whatever reason it is that you don't want to work with vendor, I'd still recommend keeping the account purely for that content piece. There is nothing to prevent you from having the account purely for content. You're not required in any way to, to actually put the stock through on vendor. It's built into the T's and C's. You can just have it as a content like holding area. Secondly, it's also generally going to be the more profitable of the two. If it's been set up correctly, and yes, there is obviously, as I mentioned previously, if it's not, then there is a correction piece that would need to be need to go on. But if you've got new lines and other things that are being added, it's usually the more profitable of the two. Um, and I can go into a bit further like um, later on this, what needs to be done to get it to that point. But it is generally set up correctly the more profitable of them. And the last one is a bit difficult to confirm, but I think we've probably all had our suspicions on this one. If you do look at, if you ever go into like the subcategories in Amazon and look at what the top products are, it's vendor. It's going to be vendor across the board that are selling those. Amazon does bias towards its own. And while FBA and vendor should be nigh on identical in terms of how um, they should rank, there are a couple of subtle factors that Amazon does put into consideration. Some of that is, um, I think, just an internal bias towards their own systems, but they do seem to have a bias towards that ranking in terms of how they are put forward. So 
now moving on to once you've got past the individual benefits, the two accounts, running them in tandem, what does that look like? And what are the challenges of then doing that? So obviously two accounts means more complexity. You are going to have um, listings in both places. You're going to have inventory in both places. Ideally, you would have advertising in both places and promotions in both places. So in, in many ways, it's an increase in work because you have to make sure that you are set, you've got your stock management where you know what is going to where and when. So you obviously, let's say your bias is towards vendor. You don't want to be putting loads of stock into FBA because you're just going to be paying a load in storage fees. But if um, vendor isn't picking things up, you don't want to have too little in FBA because then you're going to run out of stock and you've defeated the whole point of running the hybrid by doing it that way. So stock management is a big piece. Knowing where your bias will be at any one time, looking at what you expect each platform to do in the early stages, biasing towards that, towards FBA, so that you can guarantee you've got the stock in for the sales, having a plan for if vendor picks up faster or slower than expected, do you put more stock in? Do you pull stock back out of FBA? Do you look to run um, a high level of promo on FBA to clear the stock out once you've got the stuff into vendor? How will that impact um, vendor in terms of it having to hold on to the stock? So there's a lot to consider on those kind of like moving parts around it and having that concrete strategy in place means that when you get to these points quick decisions can be made and that's what you want is to be able to act quickly on this and to not have stock just left in one place for too long or having to be reactive and putting stock into fba when you're already starting to run out because they're and they're taking too long to get everything in and this is probably the area that I've, we've seen people make the most mistakes is around that inv in inventory management piece and the the main mistake that we see people make is having too much stock in FBA and at the end of it, then taking too long to pull that back out and having like high storage charges for, for having that stock in there. After that catalog management, you've obviously got to have the listing in both places. Um, and Amazon is very particular about how things are entered into listings. I personally think that it is best to put the listing into vendor first. Vendor gets the best control and the account that creates the listing does seem to get a bit better control again than that. So being vendor as the creator and owner of the product is the ideal, in my opinion. After that, it's, it's also then a lot easier to add it to seller because if you go in, you add it on to seller first, you still have to do a flat file or form submission on vendor. But if you create the thing in vendor first, then on seller, you've got the option of just going, I have one of these to sell and you put in very little info. So it makes that setup piece a lot faster there. Um, and then budget allocation. So this is the promo advertising piece. So a lot of advertising only runs if you hold the buy box. So you need to make sure that you've got campaigns built out in both, and you need to make sure that you've got budget split across the two. And obviously, if you've got an advertising budget of 5K, you don't want to put 5K into both because you've got a risk of spending both. So it's keeping an eye on, bo on both accounts and going, well, I'll put half in each potentially, and then I'll up this one as I'm seeing it's biased towards that. So there is a monitoring piece on the advertising. And then with the promotions piece, you're, it's making sure that if you are running the promotions in an account, that you are actually getting the buy box, that you're not allocating promo budget to something that's never actually going to come to fruition. Something to also just add on this piece with the advertising and budget uh, um, allocation piece is pricing your products. So let's say you've got a product that you sell for $9.99 and you've been selling it through seller, it's picked up, you've got all the traction, vendors now picked it up, goes in $9.99 and vendors at $9.99, FBA is at $9.99, they are going to be competing for that buy box. And what you're effectively going to do is actually sabotage your own advertising on both accounts because Amazon is going to switch which one it is offering at any one time. So there's a piece around making sure that you're not competing against it. So if you've put the stock into um, vendor, raise that FBA price. doesn't have to be massive, but just enough so that they're not competing with each other. And then you can either have that as a permanent change or when vendor goes out, stop moving it back down. But that's obviously more effort, more tracking and as a more dynamic approach um, and that really does come down then individually to how much of a difference that slight price difference makes on your conversion and then the last piece is international expansion um, so international expansion so this is europe this is usa any of the different markets 
vendor again very pessimistic on ordering with new things and trying to um it, it's a difficult platform to do a launch on. by doing it with seller you can control where that stock is going you can control how much you're putting into that market and you again can ramp it up and build that over time so this is very much similar to that initial launch piece um of first products it's very similar with that inter international expansion okay so on launching products and what that kind of looks like so i would start with launching new products in seller and i know that i said initially list products in vendor i'm not changing that still list it there so list it in vendor have it all there amazon will come in with their blocked existing offers because they're not seeing um, any track uh, any traction or anything going on there ignore them don't touch them build everything up on seller when sellers got to a point where you're actually um tracking well you've got the listing already in vendor then you can start accepting the orders running all of the stock through there inventory management how much and where that is always going to be a case-by-case -case basis so competitor analysis what it, um, where you expect um products to land what you're expecting them to do i would say in the beginning it's more important to have m more stock than less stock it is it's better in that initial stage to pay the higher storage fee than to risk running out of stock. It will hurt you more in the long run. It will take you longer to ramp up. You will have just higher costs if you do so. Obviously, to a point, like if you're forecasting 10 sales a week, there's no point in putting in 10,000 units. But if you're saying 10 sales a week and you know that it's going to take you a month to get more stock on, don't put in 40, put in 80 type thing. Catalog management, so aligning these products in the stages. This is why I think that it's important to do the initial creation still in vendor, even though you're going to be starting that launch in seller, is you don't have that catalog management piece potentially coming in at that transition point. You want everything clean and smooth when you're moving from seller to vendor. So you want everything set up in vendor from the beginning, seller being the main thing that, that's launching it. And what you might find when you get to that point is vendor doesn't pick it up naturally. Vendor is quite a pessimistic platform. And by naturally, I mean just them organically placing a purchase order. But you might get to a point where you're happy with the sales. The sales are where they're going to is around where they, you expect them to get to. Vendor hasn't picked it up. That's where Born to Run would come in. I wouldn't run Born to Run right at the beginning because there are risks of Born to Run. When you accept, you either have to accept the stock's coming back to you if it doesn't sell, or they get to take that 25% if it doesn't sell by the end of that period. And there are caps to Born to Run. They've now brought it, it, they've rolled out now that you have to have brand registry connected. Um, so if you are one of the lucky ones that still have a vendor account from years ago and don't have brand reg for a particular, or maybe you just have a range that you don't have brand registry for, that's going to be a restriction in terms of running Born to Run on that. Born to Run also has a financial cap, so number of, um, so amount of open orders you can have on it. They also have to see that they believe that that line will sell through in that time period. So there's, there's a lot of restrictions on there. So while it's a great resource and I do advocate using it, there's, there's a caveat of not being overly dependent or reliant on it in general. So always first try and get those natural orders through by Amazon just organically placing those POs. But if you find that's not happening, that's where I would start using Born to Run to try and push those through. So, and then that, again, leads into the international expansion piece where it will be all of these things um, in those orders again. Okay, um, any questions on any of those different points we've just gone through? Thank you. Uh, I think you'll all agree that was a very informative presentation full of great information and advice. If you'd like to pose any questions, please do so now. I'll get started on the ones we've already received. Um, so, do you advise making stock permanently unavailable on VC if Amazon are setting the sellout price too high and you have cover on SC? If you are unhappy with that price, yes. Um, I would then, after that, check the listing quality dashboard. So the listing quality dashboard on vendor is something they have been pushing quite a lot recently. If you're finding that your RRP is too too high, there is a good chance that on that listing quality dashboard that asset will be listed as having missing values. Um, this is, I would actually recommend to anyone who's got a vendor account check that listing quality dashboard. Amazon last month rolled out 
a thousand required fields across the different subcategories. So they're very specific requirements like saucepan, for example, base and top diameters. And where this has happened, a lot of data has not got to the correct bits of the system. So either way you've, even when you've provided this data before, especially things like RRPs, that's sometimes been dropped in the system. So where you are seeing that price is too high, check that. But if they are still continuing to push that price too high and that is a problem, stop supplying it. I just, they will eventually, they should eventually bring it back in line because they are not going to be winning the buy box where seller is going to be um, winning the buy box because it has that lower price. But if you've got um, returns as an option on the account, then what is a real concern there, obviously, is vendor will continue to bring that stock in just to slap you as a return later down the line. So, yeah, I'd, I'd put that as a, out of stock until that's corrected. Thank you. Yeah. Um, why is the vendor more profitable? Yeah, I thought we'd get this question. So the vendor is more profitable if it, it, most of the time if set up correctly. So obviously seller, you have your referral fee, which is an average across the board, I'll say is about 15%. I know that there are categories where that differs both up and down, but you've got your 15% referral fee. You then have the storage fees if you're running FBA, and you also have your FBA fulfillment fee. And if you don't, you've then got FBM and then you've got individual shipping of different products. With vendor, you've got your co-op terms. Co-op terms, if they've, as an average, should be around the 12% mark. If yours are higher than that, then that's obviously going to affect what I'm about to talk about, but there's options to potentially negotiate there, especially if you have the comfort of a seller account where you don't have to be dependent on vendor trading. You can say, I'm stopping trading until my terms are improved. So you've got 12% there compared to a 15% referral fee. That's just an average that I see across clients. After that, you then have your fulfillment fees um, to put the products into Amazon because you're selling um, cases of products into Amazon, or at least should be. If you check your what your case pack max is for Amazon, you can optimize that so that you're sending um, a higher level of stock into Amazon at each time for each asset. Then you're not paying much in terms of the distribution there. Amazon covers all of the distribution out to the customer, so you're not covering that in the same way you do with FBA fee. So it all comes down to that margin that you've set with Amazon. Vendor managers, when they first onboard you, always say that they have a particular margin they need to hit. They offer to help set all of the products up, provide them a list of everything they want. And I've heard everything from 35% to 60% of the margin that they're after. Can't stress enough, it's a lie. They are not in any way um, forced to have a margin there set up. The reason that they try and get you to onboard all of your products at the beginning on sign up on vendor is because it's the only point they get to touch those assets and try and get you to put a price into the system. And once the price is in the system, it's difficult to get an increase on. So when you do load products in initially, I advise actually starting at an incredibly slim margin of 5%. If you do that, Amazon will accept that. There is nothing in their system to prevent them from accepting it. What they can and will do later is ask for that price to go down, but it does not go down by nearly as much as people would think, depending on like the type of product, the, the size, weight, or how long it takes to sell through. You would usually expect that percentage to settle somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, maybe as low as 20, depending if it's a particularly heavy product, which is slightly slower on selling through. But if that's been where you set it up, then it should be more profitable that way. Thank you. We found that promotions don't seem to be as successful on FC as on BC for the same assets and SOA. Does BC have more weight when it comes to promotions? Good question. Technically, it shouldn't. Um, there are a couple of things that to consider. Uh, I do have a question on this, which is, are they running FBA or FBM? Because if it's FBA, it shouldn't make much of a difference, if any. It will make probably a subtle difference because, as I said earlier, vendor does buy a slightly towards itself. If it's fulfilled by merchant, then I would say it would make a difference because you've got that ship that you're going to have a lower conversion rate anyway because you've got fulfilled by merchant on. Thank you. If we were to create a UK listing on our vendor account, would this content appear on a US selling list? Oh, um... Not necessarily. So Amazon does have a uh, global listing um, settings that exist in various different forms. And there is actually a tab on Amazon called global listing settings, but that's a separate thing. So just not confuse people. 
So global listing attribution and kind of shared data across does exist. Um, it's, it, it's a difficult one to answer. Amazon is trying to make it so that the data is shared more across these things, which I know does cause people conflict, especially when you have a company in the UK and a company in the US selling the same thing, but with a very different brand perspective. Um, the content, that some content is more likely to pull across than others. So I think images at the moment is something we're seeing pulls across quite a lot. Titles and bullet points less so, but can. The annoying short answer to it is it can, but there's no hard and fast rule on it. And if you've got a situation where you're unhappy with it, either pulling through or not pulling through, then it's case logs and disputes to try and um, correct what it, what it is you're seeing. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our questions. The presentation and speaker contact details will be shared with you this week, as well as the recording of the webinar. Coming up tomorrow, Worknest will deliver the webinar on how to success, um, how to succeed with a hybrid working model, which takes place at two o'clock. Thank you all uh, for attending the event today, and all details can be found on our website for future webinars. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.